Hey, how's it going everyone? This is YLAM here. In today's vlog, I want to talk to you about a project that's probably going to last for the entire winter. A bunch of folks and I are going to be looking at building some big racing drones. This is something that I've been wanting to do for a while. There's a few people that have already been working towards that over on the East Coast and I kind of want to jump in and be a part of that. Luckily enough for me, during Multi-GPIO, I met up with Andrew and Detroit Joe and it looks like they were all thinking about the same lines that I was. So we came up with an idea of how we can do this and also kind of document what we're doing. It's going to be a very interesting journey. Joe, he is always kind of a little skeptical about these big frames, so we're trying to convince him to design some really cool frames for us. Andrew, as one of the testers and also just a prolific builder, he's really helping me out by letting me help him out throughout the entire process. So this is kind of the first part of what we're going to be discussing. We were on a Skype call, so there's not going to be a whole lot of video involved, but it was still a very interesting conversation, so you might enjoy this. That's what this part of the video is going to be about. As we get into this entire process, there is going to be a lot more to share. There's going to be a lot more to see. So hopefully, you bear with us. Tell us what you think, and uh, yeah, enjoy the journey that we're going to be on. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Joe Engelin. I'm the, the owner of the Detroit Multi-Rotor Company where we make racing frames. Uh, we make all kinds, um, you know, from large to small. And today I'm really excited to talk to everybody about making something larger. Okay, my name is Andrew Weibold. Um, I am a Cincinnati, Ohio based pilot. I fly a lot of uh, big stuff, weird stuff, fast stuff, and have been going down the path of building X-class drones for a little while now. And I'm also a test pilot for Joe with Detroit Multirotor. He is a prolific builder. Have you ever seen his room? Good gosh, he's just plastered with all sorts of stuff. But let's go ahead and get into the subject. We're really talking specifically about X-Class, but there's actually quite a few leagues that have classes that are pretty similar. We have Freedom Class. We have the Titan Drones. So the first question we're going to kind of tackle is what is X-Class and why are we interested? Andrew, you want to start us off on that? So X-Class is a um, racing league designed for giant drones. Um, the size requirements are the drone has to measure from motor to motor 800 millimeters to 1200 millimeters. Uh, and there's some other requirements also, but the idea behind it is uh, very large drones that are easily visible to spectators. Most of the time when you're watching a drone race, you're either watching through goggles or you're watching a couple of lights flying around the track. And it, for someone who's experienced with drone racing, it can be very exciting. But people who don't really have a lot of exposure to the sport can be kind of underwhelmed because it's not visually spectacular uh, from a spectator point of view. So the goal with X-Class is to bring giant drones that are um, capable of performing close to the same level of our current racing multi-rotors, but also um, you know, add a little bit more spectacle to it. All right, Detroit Joe, as a frame company and a skeptic, what, what, <laughs> what, <laughs> what made it so that we could get you onto this podcast and uh, get you to design some big-ass drones for us? Well, to, to be honest, I, I'm still a little skeptical, right? And I hope to not be at the end of this conversation. But um, it's something new, just like Andy said. It's like, hey, it's, that's new. That's interesting. But I've actually had a lot of interest from a lot of people, right? You're a frame manufacturer. How come you don't do X class? Oh, I don't know. You know, tell me about this X class. Why is it so cool? Why do you want one so bad? So, you know, I'm starting to hear that and I'm starting to believe what people are saying. So I really, really, really want to try something. Now, for I.O., we actually did cut a frame. You know, it was a very, very quick slapdash job for one of our pilots, Ricky Bobby. Unfortunately, couldn't get it working, well, partially because the hardware or the electronics are so new for us. But, it, you know, it was it was big. It was like, wow, that's that's pretty massive. You want that much carbon? OK, fine. So we did it. And, uh, and I just kind of want to continue exploring that. You know, I, I saw the X class race at I.O., at races at I.O., and I thought, oh, OK, I, I kind of see it. You know, they're still a little slow, but I kind of see where there's interest and I kind of see where it's getting better. And, you know, to me, it, it, it harkens back to the days in 2013, 2014, where we we're, where were building DJI Phantom 450s, right? Like like all the hardware is so new, it's it's almost like that. 
And it's like, oh, man, I got it up in the air. That's pretty cool. Check this thing out. It's loud, isn't it? That's pretty neat. But I want to see where we can take this. You know, um, I want to see X Class become something because I think it'd be, I think it'd be pretty cool, and I really do think that spectators need something uh, that they can see. That's why we don't have like you know tens of thousands of people coming to a race because they don't see anything unless they know what they're looking for. It just looks like a bunch of black dots. Um, Andrew, for you mm-hmm. as a pilot, what excites you as a as a pilot? Does X Class feel any different than our than regular five inch drones? Uh, it does. Yeah. You, so far, at least with my experience, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not flying the absolute best, uh, most expensive X class rigs in the world. I'm what I'm flying so far are are pretty budget, but, um, you know, I wanted to start out with something that's a little bit less expensive and and learn the lessons that I know I'm going to learn in this journey before I start spending a hundred dollars a motor, um, to build something that's really, really fast. But, um it's um it's definitely you can tell that it's a much bigger aircraft the way that it carries its weight and momentum is very different from a five inch quad you can't really fly in the like with the same expectation of being able to go screaming through a gate at full throttle top speed and then immediately um you know flip a 180 punch the throttle stop all of your momentum and then start the other direction so it it generally behooves you to be a little bit smoother and try to maintain your momentum a little bit better uh Mm -hmm. just because you know some some of these things are um you know two three four five kilograms every time i fly one of these things in anger if you will uh, (laughs) um there's there's certainly more risk associated with it if you know if you're if your X-Class goes into a yaw spin of death, then it might actually be a yaw spin of death. So, <laughs> He actually brings up a really interesting point, and this is kind of one of the conundrums that we have. And this is where we need the expertise of Joe because one of the things he brings up is that you invest in all this, you build this big-ass rig, but you're not quite – you know, capable of trying to bring out the 100% of it because you know how much money is in the air or the risk factor involved. So one of the things that we that we really need to tackle is that whatever frame that we design, it has to be durable in places where it needs to be. But mm-hmm. it almost feels like, and this goes back to like car design, right, where they have crumple zones where, well, not, not like high end because like the whole thing's a crumple zone in those, but... <laughs> Um, points where it should break, where it's easy to repair, where the repairs are, you know, easy to do and cost effective. And that's one of the things that I would like to talk about. Joe, do you think that's possible? Well, what's interesting about what I've seen in X-Class so far is you're never going to break the body. That's never going to happen, right? You're going to crumple arms and you're going to crumple motors and ESC wires and all that. That's that's where 99% of, of the damage is going to be. So, yeah, as a frame designer, sure, I'll build you a frame. I'll build you a body, no problem. It's what are you going to do with the arms, right? People want aluminum arms. People want wood arms. People want carbon arms. But that's where the, the, the break's going to happen. And to be honest, though, in, in, in frame design, 80% of your time is designing the arm so it doesn't break, so it's not too heavy and all that. The body, it you know, you just you say, okay, is it big enough to hold the flight controller and a camera? Wonderful. Okay, what are we going to do with those arms? So I think it's possible why. Now, the thing, the, the, the thing that I would, because the arms are going to be the thing that breaks, right? You come in there with one quad that has like four sets of arms, right? And then motors are really heavy, right, Andrew? And, uh, you know, if you ding a motor on a gate, which, my God, you're going to fly these things through gates? That's crazy. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's your expense. I think everything can be housed in something that's pretty damn tough and it's not going to break no matter what you do to it, because the arm is going to break first, right? The arm is going to take 80% of the impact and, mm-hmm. and that's where all the energy is. Uh, you want it to be breakable because you want to save the rest of the frame, but at the same time, it has to be rigid enough to where when it's actually going through all these maneuvers, it's not going to flex too much to affect performance. Uh, I know, Andrew, you right. kind of, you know, tested aluminum and also wood. I don't think you had a carbon one yet. What are your thoughts on that? So um, 
that you, currently the two rigs that I have, one has aluminum arms, one has wood. Um, I think carbon is the way to go, but there's a caveat with that. Obviously, um, you know, carbon is going to be lighter, stronger. Um, what I've seen that seems to be the best design right now are hollow carbon tubes. Um, and then basically adapters using either a 3D printed sandwich mount uh, for the motors and the body or like machined aluminum uh, clamps, basically. Mm -hmm. um, now, you have a pretty hard time snapping uh, like a 19 or 22 millimeter carbon tube, but it's certainly possible. Um, what I think would probably be best for that would be to engineer failure points in your mounting solutions. So, mm. example for the motors, you could use like a 3D printed TPU uh, clamp to clamp onto the round bar or the round tube. And if your motor gets a really hard hit, it would twist on that instead of, you know, ripping out of the mounting plate or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and then you can also have like bullet connectors on your ESC wires as a breakaway. And then on your ESC, since we're running very big ESCs that need tons and tons of airflow, you realistically shouldn't mount them in the body. Uh, they tend to catch on fire, literally. Uh, hmm. Some of these rigs pull so much amperage, uh, especially if you're brave enough to run them on 8S instead of 6, that ESCs just catch on fire. Um, huh. They solder themselves. So, um, they need a lot of airflow. So then you can have an XT60 connector for power that could break away and then a servo, you know, a, a servo connector for the signal wire or something like that at the body to interface with the arm. You could again have like either a, a TPU, um, TPU printed clamp or something like that. And then use fasteners that can, you know, like aluminum fasteners maybe that can break. So you engineer a failure point. Mm -hmm. Uh, at a fastener instead of at the arm and you just have a box of aluminum bolts you break an arm off you pull the old bolts out put new bolts in plug your connectors back in and you're up in the air um, okay that's just something i've been toying around with conceptually um mm -hmm. and then obviously the uh the previously mentioned master air screw propellers they work really great and they're very tough but uh, I managed to break two of them at the race, and they are like sixteen dollars a piece. So. Holy jeepers! <laughs> <laughs> Everything yeah. about this is expensive. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's anything <clears throat> you can do about that. I think that's just part of the cost of the game. Yeah, definitely. So what I'm hearing is, and we're, we're kind of getting into frame design at this point because that's kind of the whole point is. Um, at this point, we, what we want is to have a rig that we can actually fly to 100% theoretically without having to be so risk averse because we're putting so much money into the air. Um, you know, we're discussing quite a lot about, you know, where where we want the frame to break. And also, um, in my opinion, uh, Joe, this is kind of the innovation part is how we can better protect these motors. Because if we're putting $120 motors up into the air, the traditional way of protecting motors that we do in 5-inch, I don't think it's enough at this point. I think we actually really need to put a lot of thought into protecting motors. And when that arm breaks apart, you know, we do our best job, you know, protecting our investments. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, I agree with you. Number one, why is that, uh, you know, uh, the way we do five inch protection is definitely not going to work. Um, and I, I think a lot of this kind of comes down to Andrew had mentioned that, that these are two to five gram, five kilograms, right? And there's, there's a lot of variance there. So Andrew, if, if you were just going to go naked as heck, right? Just the bare bones of where are you at? Are you at like one kilogram, two kilograms? Uh, where are you great, at? That's a great question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I have a scale sitting in front of me and my X class sitting behind me. So, if you give me just one moment, I will uh, I will throw one on the scale because the ones that I have are about as bare bones and lightweight as you can get. Don't forget um, to weigh your battery. 
Oh, I'll throw that on too. Yeah. Well, the, okay, that's interesting. Do we want lightweight and bare bones, right? Just to mimic what we do in the in the traditional quad classes, or do you want something? Um, you know, if if the purpose is to to wow the audience, to be honest. Like the two sticks is not going to, I, it doesn't seem to wow the audience to me, right? It's two sticks in the air and they all look like two sticks in the air. <laughs> I agree right? with you on that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so here's my opinion on that as a person who's going to be investing my own money into it. Um, at the stages that we're talking about, I much rather have a protective rig to where I can keep my investments after I start flying to a minimum. You know, mm-hmm. if somebody else is paying for my bill. Sure, I'll, I'll fly whatever lightweight yeah. thing that they pay for. But <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm seeing these costs, right? And right. I don't know if you want to speak to these costs, Joe, but, like, you know, they're not insignificant. And we definitely want to continue, you know, building these things and having fun with them. But I don't, right. what do you think, Joe? Do you, would you what? have, like, a way to convert a heavy armored rig into a light rig or would you just be two different frames i think they're two different frames to be honest i think they're two different frames now we can talk about frame accoutrements right you know you talked about crumple zones early earlier right crumple zone in a car is essentially uh hollow plastic parts right plastic Mm -hmm. ridges here and there right that, that take space but that space is supposed to be taken up in an impact and you can almost do something, or you can think of something like like form or like a Lexan or something. You know, Carbati Lexan, with right? The, like the four mil Lexan. Now that stuff's tough, right? If we built if we built something around the motor that's made out of four mil Lexan, I don't know if it's gonna. I don't know if that'll shatter first, or you know, or or, or if it'll it'll deflect the shot or whatever, or you know, I, I really don't know. I think that's part of the experimentation we have to do, and. Uh, I, I'm kind of leaning towards. Gosh, I would if I really want to wow spectators. I do want to. I want to see this thing. What's one thing? One way to see this thing is light it up, right? So if you get some semi opaque Lex- Lexan, you put one light in there, and the whole thing is lit up, right? Then you can then you can almost talk about car lines and oh look, that body looks really cool. Because to be honest, like in, in the five inch market, right? You know what sells? What looks freaking cool? Yeah, right. They're definitely. all the, they're all they're all what two twenty. They're they were one ninety five to two twenty five inch quads. Motors on the four ends. It's either stretch or X. It, there's not much more you're doing with that, Joe. Okay. Yes. I'm gonna pitch you an idea. What okay, you should do it. is you should have um you know the arms. They should be let's yeah. sand tubular, and you should fit the LEDs into the arms or into yeah. the tube. So you I would hear ha- you. so you would have basically glowing arms. Yes. Yes, I have to talk to my buddy John O'Brien. He does a lot in the car world, especially making car bodies. So he'll help me with that. The formula Lexan. Let's see what we can do with that. And yeah. we have to see how much it weighs too. So actually, Andrew, that's a good. That's a, here's a here's an interesting question for you, right? You know, the, the five inch quad guys are always light, 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 light. Two fifty five versus two fifty is huge, man. Okay, in the X class world, is that the same? Uh, so far, no. Okay. Um, like I said, I was flying probably one of the lighter rigs out there, and according to my scale, it's two and a half kilograms. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, It's four pounds, five pounds of weight. (laughs) Yeah, she's she's a thick girl. Um, (laughs) most of the rigs that were out there were a lot heavier. Um, you know, I'm sure some of them were probably six kilograms or more, but... Well, were the... the the competitive rigs six kilograms, or were the cool rigs six kilograms? Um, I don't think. I mean, I don't think the competitive ones were that heavy. The cool okay. ones, some of the cool ones probably were. Some of them were, you know, three, four, and five. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the cooler ones I saw was put together by a group of college students from Florida. Uh, their company's called Soar Aerospace. Uh, I got to talk to these guys a lot and um, was really impressed with the design of their build. They had a um, really awesome 3D printed canopy over it, and it was a like a long stretched X. But they're also using this custom colored carbon that they're making. Mm. Uh, they used square carbon tubes for the arms and then put dowel rods inside of them, wooden dowels, to increase rigidity and mm-hmm. strength. 
All right. So if we can segue into a little bit of design, right? Because, you know, that's what I'm kind of keen on. And I'm sure you guys are interested as well. What I see in the air from the spectator's point of view is four sticks in the air, right? Everybody and, and everybody always comes up to you and says, dude, I, I just sketched this on paper. Look at check it out. Yeah, it's an X, bro. I got it. OK, yeah. you know, it's just like a small body. Right. Is that what what we should be doing or do we need something bigger? Uh, you know, what what are you what are your thoughts on that? And do you like X or stretch squished? Does it matter? Um, personally, for me. So if you have a big body on it, you're creating more air resistance, obviously, and it is going to slow you down. Mm -hmm. um, and on a mini quad, it's a little bit of a concern. But if you're mounting something that's the size of a dinner plate on one of these things and you're going at 80 miles an hour, you're going to be creating a ton of aerodynamic drag. Okay. So with a canopy, I would say, you know, I would I, I want to say bigger is better because it looks awesome, but it would also have to be streamlined and aerodynamic. Sure, sure. You know, I kind of think of heli canopies at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that that kind of idea, I think. And the the guys from Soar Aerospace had a very aerodynamic pod. It was, um, you know, it was sharp at the top and then spread down the sides. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a canopy like that would be very successful. And I think a larger canopy would look cooler. Um, sure. my, my personal preference for racing frames uh, is a stretched X. Mm -hmm. I think they, I think they handle a little bit better in the turns. Um, and with these things, you're not really yawing at all when you're flying them. You get up, get in the air, and then basically peg the throttle at full throttle, and then you're, steel it, you're steering with aileron roll. Um, hmm. Yaw a little bit, depending on the complexity of the maneuver, but you're basically almost vertical the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think being a stretch deck would probably help and make it a little bit more maneuverable. Um, I know the um, DCL guys, or it's either DCL or DR1, uh, they're doing their Pro Series, which is basically X-Class rigs, but they have a lot of LEDs on them, they're really lit up, and they're, you know, they look awesome in the air. Aren't the, aren't the DCL guys doing like 325 millimeter, though? I mean, isn't there like a, what so, are their spec classes, 325? Yes. That is one of that. Yes, that isn't their pro class. That's a, that's oh, okay. a spec class. Um, mm. Pro class is actually, I don't know the exact frame size, but they're around eight eight hundred to a thousand millimeters, um, and they're actually using the T motor F one thousand motors, which are kind of the gold standard for X class too. Um, they just happen to cost one hundred and twenty dollars a piece. <laughs> you know, there are other options too. There's there's motor options ranging from twenty dollars. Forty dollars, sixty, uh, and hundred and twenty. Wait, there's a twenty dollar X class motor. Yes, I have them sitting right next to me. What do you think of them? They're underpowered on six S. Uh, they're not okay. Um, Good practice I, motor. Yeah, maybe. Um, I think they'll handle eight S, and I think on eight S they'd be fast enough. Uh, they're only a four hundred kV, so. A lot of the faster guys are using um, 600 kV ish, or they're using smaller props, slightly smaller motors, and like 1000 kV. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of those guys are using like a 3515 size motor in the 1000 ish kV range, and um, they're using like a 10 inch Dropner tri blade. Um, okay. So it's, it's a very aggressive 10 inch tri blade, but I think the guy, one of the guys that took like second or third, second or fourth or something was running that setup. And the thing was unbelievably fast. Yeah. Uh, so, wait, so I've, I've heard 13 inch master air screw and then a 10 inch Gropner. So there's a big prop variation here. Yeah. So you have props ranging anywhere from like 10 inches up to 16 inches. Wow. Uh, the 16 inch guys are usually using by blades, uh, oftentimes like carbon fiber props. Or some guys are using like APC props, like 16 by eights or something. Okay. Um, I've been meaning to get some and test them out. Uh, mm -hmm. If I can get something that's a little bit 
a little bit bigger and still a really steep pitch. I think those 400s, those um, the $20 motors could still be fast on 6S, but uh, I think they and the the amp draw on them now is is very reasonable. Um, mm-hmm. I think I'm maxing out at like 85 amps, which is super duper low for these aircraft. Um, there are guys that are pulling 300 300 or more amps, and they're actually welding their battery connectors together when they're pushing these things. So they literally <laughs> they have to cut the wires instead of pull the battery connector apart. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just to make sure I heard this right, because you know we have friends at like Sunny Sky and and. and places like that right and i'm sure brother hobby would do something too but uh, the, the motor that would work oh really but you well, said 30 35 35 size can 35 15s uh so those are the smaller ones that's okay. that's more of a lightweight build the bigger ones are a 41 size uh 41 diameter mm-hmm. uh, so they're around like 41 the ones that i have are 41 14 uh, but like 41 14 41 16 Anything in that range is good for the bigger props. Um, and what and what KV? Between four hundred and eight hundred, depending on uh-huh. what what kind of prop you're trying to swing. Um, right. I know, like one of the really fast setups is those Master Air Screw thirteen by twelve by threes on a six hundred and sixty six KV motor. Um, those those things are real fast uh but you're also you're, you're pulling a lot of amperage uh, so you know you talk about amperage and and amperage the high amperage leads to your your flight time right how long do you expect x classes to be up for i mean these are supposed to be big spectator things right are you supposed to do a yeah. 10 minute race or a two minute race closer to two minutes you know three i think three minutes depending on your battery size mm-hmm. uh, being in the air for three minutes would be nice but we're currently using the go-to battery is a 6S5000. Um, okay. Some some guys are running um, some guys are running 8S. They'll use two 4S packs and run them in series. Um, <laughs> right now, the ESCs out there just can't handle 8S very well. They tend to catch on fire a lot. Uh, <laughs> the 8S rigs, when they work, are just dominant mm-hmm. they have so much more speed and power um but you know if you stepped up to like a 6s 8000 yeah you're adding more weight but you could also race for four minutes and make it a more exciting race mm-hmm. yeah so i you know i've i haven't kept up with the x class guys um i know there's a facebook group out there for the x class but is there is there talk on standardizing certain parts of it, you know, or I mean, just or is it like survival of the fittest and we're just too early to figure it out? You know, like what when we talk about the blackout days, right? What was the motor? It was a 2204, 2300, right? It was right. probably a sunny sky until Cobra came out and, and called her 2205 or 2204, exactly. right? But that that became the standard, right? Like ESCs now, there's there's a standard for this. There's a standard for that almost. Are you get is, is it getting to that point or is it still the Wild West? Uh, right now, it's still the Wild West. Um, there's there's a couple of standout motors that are that are very popular. Um, one of them is there's a company called RC Timer that um, really kind of started pioneering a lot of the, the the good components that could let you run a really fast X class rig. Um, they they have an 80 amp. BL Heli S ESC that a lot of guys are using that's supposedly capable of holding up to 8S. Um, it isn't really. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it will, but a lot of guys catch them on fire. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't think those are quite there yet. But there's there's a few other options out there. Um, I The video I shared with you guys before we started recording this was... Um, a new ESC that I literally just saw and haven't even researched yet, but apparently it will handle 100 and like 100 amps or 120 amps on 12S, which is crazy. And the motors are probably going to be, if you want to run bigger props, they're going to be a 41 size motor. If you want to run slightly smaller props and run them faster, it'll be a 35 mm-hmm. size motor. Um, right. Stator. Is there, is there a, is there a, is there a clear? Sorry, is there a clear winner in the current popularity contest? 
Is it 35s or 41s? No. Um, no. I think most people are running 41s, but okay. the some of the fastest quads at the I.O. were running 35 size. So I think it's still... Um, I think it still hasn't really ironed out. Now, for me, at least with the spirit of X-Class being a spectacle, I would prefer to see bigger motors and bigger props because they sound cooler. They're, okay. um, you know, they they just have a, a deeper hum and, a, you know, much, much louder, you know, prop tone. Well, okay, uh, just a, a few more questions, actually, Andrew. If you can really quickly... Give me a build list of components that I can get so that I can start putting one of these together. Like, what are manufacturer sizes, things like that? Where, where can I go and get these? Okay. Um, depending on your budget, um, if you want to build kind of a middle-of-the-road uh, in terms of budget X-Class, um, rctimer.com is going to be your best bet. They have pretty much everything you need. Um the ESCs that I mentioned previously, I believe they're, uh, I think they're called like RS80A or something like that. They're an 80 amp ESC that's put out by RC Timer. Um, mm -hmm. They have X class specific motors available on there also. Um, I would suggest something around 600 kV. Okay. Uh, that'll give you plenty of speed without needing to resort to 8S to go really, really fast. One of the biggest things is um, your, it's gonna be your um, power distribution. So some guys are using um, a specialized power distribution board that's basically a big hunk of copper that uh, you solder to. Uh, the more elegant solution that I'm seeing right now is using a five-slot bus bar um, that's sold on Amazon. Uh, they have a link to it on um, the X-Class website. I think that website is xclass.racing, but don't quote me on that. Let me look it up real quick so I can give you factual information. Um Okay, so their website is www.xclass.racing. Uh, that will get you to the website. And then from there, they actually have a page um, called Build Lists. It gives you huh. um, equipment lists. So some of, the, some of the options in terms of like motors um, from RC Timer are the B rotor X class motors, the X6. They have um, two different KVs. One's a 700 KV, the other's a 950. I would probably go with the 700 KV. Um, mm -hmm. It'll just keep you from catching stuff on fire a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, then they also list the P motor F1000. <laughs> 545 and a 635 kV. Um, mm -hmm. but again, $120 a piece. The B rotor motors are $70 a piece. Okay. Um, so still not cheap, but you know, you're almost half the price of a, of the other one. Um, right. Right. The, the, um, ESCs from B rotor are the RC timer BS 80 a ESCs. Mm -hmm. um, there are other ones out there too. The ones that I'm currently testing are um, the Racer Star 80 amp ESCs from Banggood. They're okay. twenty dollars a piece. They're about as cheap as you can get. Um, they're rated for 80 amps and I think up to 6s. I'm mm -hmm. going to try them on 8s and see what happens. Um, uh, another thing that I can recommend with batteries uh you want to use a 6s 5000 um high c rating battery mm -hmm. the go-to is the china hobby um g plus their 70c battery it's about 110 dollars um you also 
want to go right past XT90 and use an XT150 connector. Okay. Uh, it's actually two separate connectors, but um, that will prevent you from welding your battery connector together. Right. Right. Yeah, it's the same that you use on a, you know, like an S, like a, a fan or a DJI like 800 S800 that right. kind of connector. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. There's also so back to power distribution boards. Um, there's the Demon Pulse power distribution board, which is rated for I think two or three hundred amps. Um, it's mm. pretty stout, and it has a BEC built into it, I believe. So if you're running 8S and your other components are not rated for it, um, then you're less likely to burn out flight controllers and other things. Uh, Speaking of flight controllers, are you using using whatever the standard is for the 5-inch quads, or is there a special flight controller for this? No, I, you use a regular, any flight, any regular flight controller um, that you use on a 5-inch quad. The okay. PIE tuning is way different. Uh, you you end up turning your D gains way way down. Um, uh huh. Mine are under ten, and that's pretty pretty common across the board. Um, mm -hmm. Tune it, you know, you tune it similar to how you tune a regular mini quad, but uh, the the values are going to be way way different. Okay. Uh, I know I talked to a couple people that had tried running Butterfly on it, and they did not have good results with that. I think most people are using beta flight for it. Mm -hmm. I've also heard um, to not run D shot to run one shot five or one shot forty two. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I guess I could see that. So I think the problem is with D shot, you know, you're using a digital communication protocol and you're yep. able to make a lot of corrections very, very quickly and on a very small motor yep. that can respond very quickly. You mm -hmm. can make those corrections, but with an X class, motors just can't respond that quickly, and they just get really, really hot. Um, right, right. So I'm one shot 42 on both of mine. I know okay. a lot of guys are running multi shot also, um, with with good success. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So, that, um, I'm sorry. So we we've got this big list. Actually, I just saw the frames, and the, wow, somebody's charging. An awful lot for these frames. Uh, yeah. Um, like the Horus Dreadnought is like that's kind of been the legendary unicorn gold standard because he just didn't make any of them. Um, mm -hmm. Now he's actually supplying those frames to DCL uh, or DR1, okay. which everyone's doing the the Pro Series, but they're using T Motor F1000s and Horus Dreadnought frames for those setups. Mm -hmm. And they're very nice. Don't get me wrong. No. Uh, are you done with your parts list there, Andrew? Um, pretty much everything else. Um, you know, just a whatever VTX you like to use. I use Unify Pro HVs. Um, and then whatever whatever camera you like. Right. Uh, what a lot of people will do is they will run a heavy duty. Um, they'll either run a, a like a. a battery exclusion circuit of BEC to power all the electronics um, mm -hmm. because there can be some pretty gnarly voltage spikes. Um, I am not doing that. So I have full uh, telemetry from my Betaflight OSD giving me information on it. But again, mm -hmm. my not, you know, they're not pulling two and 300 amps. When I start doing that, I will um, set it up differently. So I just have voltage as my data. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll also probably want to run a low ESR, uh, high capacitance, like 1,000 microfarad capacitor on each PSC terminal, and probably also mm -hmm. one on your um, either battery connector or your bus bar. Um, mm -hmm. It really helps to smooth out voltage spikes going to the ESCs, and there can be some okay. really nasty voltage spikes. Right. I would right. probably, if you can... If you have them conveniently available, I'd probably get like 35 volt um, capacitors. So it gives you room to flex and go to 8S at some point if you want. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, you know, I know, I know that we're going over an hour, and I just ask one more really quick question. Kind of, you know, we, we started this because uh, I really wanted to understand what kind of frame I need to design. So I kind of want to get to that really quick. Um, Andrew, how thick carbon plating are people generally using? Is it uh, three mil, four mil? So from what I've seen, most of the bodies appear to be either two or three mil. Um, okay. They're, you know, they're using standoffs to increase the rigidity and they you know, it's a sandwich style frame. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I've seen anyone with like a four mil body plate. Um, okay. I don't, I mean, I can't really think of a reason why it would be detrimental to have that other than it's a little bit of extra added weight, but. If we're right. talking about a difference of a hundred grams, who cares? You know, on a four kilogram, <laughs> on a four kilogram quad, who cares? Uh huh. Well, I, uh, let me tell you, my friend. It, it three years from now, somebody will care. Oh, Maybe I know. Even <laughs> now, somebody will care. <laughs> I, I yeah, I could probably be, I could be listening to this three years from now, going, my God, what an idiot! Those hundred grams <laughs> went first and last. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and and then um, you mentioned two, but I heard nineteen to twenty millimeter what square carbon fiber tube with a dowel in it is kind of pretty good. Or what, um, what would you recommend? I think using a round tube, um, like I don't know, somewhere between like nineteen and twenty two millimeters, whatever whatever is reasonable to get a hold of, and at least, I mean, ideally like two millimeters thick, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't done a ton of looking into this particular part of it, but okay. something that's going to be strong and, and really nice and rigid. Right, right. Well, I got a lot of people who want to do this, right? And and if I say, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to space these brackets like 19 apart. Are people going to scream at me? You know, like what is what is generally the standard? I could I could space them bigger, and we could just cut different uh, you know different uh, bracing options for depending on what you're doing. But then so, you're also wasting stuff, right? Right. So I think the best way to secure the arms to the body would be with clamps, like, you know, 3D, like 3D printed uh, clamps. Mm -hmm. um, so you could change the interior diameter on those clamps right. to accommodate realistically any size, um, any size tubing you want. And then you'd maintain a constant stack height and then just adjust the, um, the clamps. That way, when you right. crash, um, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of shock absorption. And on the motor end, if you do the same idea, mm -hmm. the motor can just twist on the mm -hmm. tooth rather than experience tons and tons of torque and bend a motor bell um, mm -hmm. or something like that. I think that mm -hmm. would help to reduce some of the damage to the motors in in big crashes. So how, how beefy does that center section have to be? Like, I mean, can I, can I go, you know, as close to the tube as possible and make it really light and stick like, or do I have to, should I add a lot of beef around it um, to, to handle the, you know, the, the, the twisting forces? I would have a lot of beef around it. Um, okay. You know these these motors are generating. I I'd have to look at the thrust data, but I think some of them are generating, you know, four kilograms of thrust per corner. Wow. Okay. Or so, or more. I mean, I haven't really I haven't really run the numbers, uh -huh. the actual thrust data numbers, but you know, you're talking power to weight ratio, maybe not quite as good as a five inch mini quad, but uh, mm -hmm. they're they're not too far behind. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, especially when you're, you're really yanking on them, it's going to be putting quite a lot of stress on it. And I think mm -hmm. having it more rigid rather than lighter would benefit. So in the X class community, is it really fly what you brung or are there levels? You know how in the, in the mini quad world, we have three inch, five inch, you know, and then, and then up, or is it pretty much just like, Hey man, if you, if it's here, I don't care if it's a, a, a kilogram, I don't care if it's 10 kilograms, you're racing. Yeah. It's, you know, is, it's there, more, is there talk? It, it's more run what you brung. Um, uh -huh. you know, the guys, the most competitive guys running five inch mini quads or, you know, running, racing mini quads are racing. Generally speaking, 
five inch quads. There's a few, you know, a few examples out there of guys that run four inch or three inch or, yeah. um, you know, I like to run six inch every now and then depending on what kind of racing I'm doing. But, um, the vast majority of people are running five inch in the X class world. It just hasn't been around long enough to really have hammered out like the optimal, um, you know, optimal size and geometry of it, you know? Right. Right, right, right. So what I'm hearing so far is you want to design a frame around the two kilogram or something that will fit in that two kilogram category. And that's the bare bones. That's two sticks in the air, but it's freaking fast two sticks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, then kind of to, to Wise point, OK, well, that's great. You know, you want to go fly two sticks. That's wonderful. But I, you know, as a race promoter. I've got these thousand people in this crowd here at this at this raceway that want to see it. So we're gonna we're gonna. I want you to fly a three kilogram thing and just put a bunch of lights on it, right? And then you know you kind of get a little heavier because you want to protect your stuff. So maybe your practice quad is actually a five is is your two kilogram with three kilograms of extra protection, right? Whether it's a Lexan body or whatever it might be. Hey Joe. So, uh, yeah. Hey, I just want to interject something because. In their pro class, which is basically them racing at like a racing venue in front of actual crowds, there's a canopy requirement. As in, you're okay. you're not racing something with two sticks. You actually need to have a body on your quad. Okay. I was actually I was gonna bring that up also. Um, that that particular fact, and with that specific um, league, all of those pilots actually have to have a part 107 because it's you know they're they're competing for a prize i guess or they're you know i can answer that a little bit too uh they have an exception with the faa basically in which if you're racing on pro class venues a lot of times uh they'll run into twilight and dark and once you do that you need to be under part 107 or you can, you're not allowed to fly under the hobby rules okay 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 got it so it's, it's like the timing of the race almost yeah okay. basically yeah all right Okay. Uh, you know, that's kind of cool because it, it gives me a framework to design something, right? I'm going to design something that will be the two bare bones. Um, you know, let's, let's, let's run it as fast as we can. And it's two kilograms. I'm sorry why you hit it. It broke. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? And <laughs> then we can start adding, we can start adding on to that. Like, Oh, no, let's make a nice canopy. So we can at least have people see it. Oh, that's great too. Hey, let's extend that canopy down the arm so that we can make this thing, you know, protected. Okay. And, and but still underneath the cover is still the same bones. Well, I think that's that's kind of it. And it's like, OK, I could see where this thing should go. Right. You design it for design it for three years from now where people are racing this and they're like, dude, I just want to win. I don't care who sees it. I don't care. And then you, you can with with attachments that you can put on. Right. Like, oh, if I really want a cool canopy because the sponsor's buying it, you know, hey, I'm in Detroit. So Ford is sponsoring this. And they want to see that Ford logo lit up. Well, okay, fine. We can we can we can bolt on the canopy. There's spots for it, right? It's a nice heli style swoop back canopy. We can do that. And then you know it's like wow, that's really great. When I'm flying when I'm flying at home and I'm practicing, I would really like these motor these motor rings that protect my motors. All right, I might take them off during the race, or I might leave them on because they're lit. Who knows? So at least the bones though are still those two kilogram bones, right? That's that's the bare minimum. That's what we build, and then we talk about what we can put onto that. Is what I'm hearing, at least. Okay, so the last segment of this podcast is going to be, uh, let's just call it features that we want Joe to incorporate into their frames. I'm going to go first. Uh, Andrew, come up with yours while I'm, I'm gabbing at Joe. A um, couple of things. Uh, Joe, I think you're really on the right track, right? Because everybody's going to be a minimalist until they start paying out of their pockets. <laughs> that's, sure. how, that's how I view it, okay? You know, right. if, if you keep bringing $200 frames or something, uh, somebody's going to be like, I want a more durable frame. But yes. here's, here's a couple of things that I would love to see in your frames. Um, keep in mind, uh, I am going to build this frame. I, I, I would love to fly something like this. Been interested in this a long time. But as a person who has been a race promoter for the past two years, here are a couple of things that I would love to see on on the actual um, uh, the frame or the quad. It might not be on the frame. Uh, number one, I agree with you. I don't really want to see two sticks in the air. What I would like to see, and this this is something just for you to think about, is 
um, maybe perhaps extending uh, the uh, the body out the back. And the reason why I say that is if you make it to where your frame kind of has a tail, that could be the bulk of where your LEDs goes because it's a little bit easier to design or to put LEDs in because putting LEDs on the arm, it's fun the first time, but after the 12th time, you get a little tired uh, of doing that. <laughs> yeah. So having uh-huh. a place where, you know, because you're pitching your quad forward, right? So the tail is going to be the thing that's highest in the air. And there's probably not going to be a lot of stuff there. So if you just stuff it full of LEDs, it kind of gives you an indication of what quad you're flying. And hopefully it's interchangeable to where you can put different lights on there and whatnot or whatever. So um, that that would be something I'd be interested in seeing is just having a, a place dedicated for LEDs now that we actually have technically a whole lot of room. Um mm-hmm. As a convenience factor, I would like it to where the arms are either retractable or removable for transport and just g- general storage because these mm-hmm. things take up a lot of space. A lot of the professional mm-hmm. rigs, um, they have folding arms because nobody wants to carry around a thousand millimeter drone, you know, all spread out when they're transporting it. It's just right. general pain in the ass, right? I would mm-hmm. also like to see the frame to where, uh, what, like what Andrew said, it's already come purpose built to run two batteries you know five to Uh eight thousand in series Uh so that you don't have to worry about uh having to do that if you want to bump from six to eight s running two packs instead so that's already kind of built in Mm -hmm. uh canopy 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 design wise i would love uh to have a nice thick um rigid frame but i would love the top plate or maybe it's a canopy whatever you want to call it uh, that is not a structural piece, but rather it's a 3D printed piece so that people can mm-hmm. put custom 3D printed parts on it to make theirs very mm-hmm. unique, very easily. So having mm-hmm. a, an extended session up to the top, but it's designed to be holding a 3D printed part so that you can make it look cool or something. That, mm-hmm. I would love to see that. And the last one, of course, and you've already mentioned this, is like if I'm going to spend $120 a motor – I better have like some nice gnarly armor plating around that sucker. <laughs> right. No, I hear you. I hear you on that one for sure. Yeah. Actually, um, you know, kind of to your second point, um, when Ricky and I were putting his frame together, we decided just in the initial talks to put the flight controller on top and then use one of the one of the existing bodies we have from our longer quads, like the Borzoi, and just just put that on there. You know, just mount it to the to the top plate. Because Ricky, Ricky's idea or his thought behind that was, hey, I'm going to have to get to the flight controller. And if you embed it in the middle of the sticks, right, just like I see a lot of people do, then I can't get to it, right? I can't plug in a USB without taking off the top. So, and that leads to, you know, that, that kind of goes with what you're talking about, why, where, you know, that canopy on top is not just purely uh, decorative, man. That's, that's for, it's going to hold your camera. It's going to hold your Flight controller is probably going to hold your VTX, stuff like that. Because if it's embedded in the body, you got to take apart everything. And every time you take apart that top plate, you run the risk of not tightening it down or, or just, you know, loosening the arms a little bit. And, and if, you're, if you've ever flown a five-inch quad, you know that there are, you know, starting line changes you make. Like, right. oh, shoot, right? This wire needs to be tucked in more, so i got to go tuck it in. If you can't do that, then you, you're going to run into trouble. So definitely, I, I'm with you on that, and uh, I think I think I've got some initial ideas now. Um, Andrew, you mentioned stretch versus X. You like stretch. Uh, a lot of people like X because it's the X class. I don't know. Is it, it? It does it make sense to make two frames or one frame that can go both ways? Um, I would say if it's, I think. I think there's probably a way you could do it where you just drill two hole patterns. Uh-huh. to allow uh, people to pick. Like, um, you know, I remember on the, the first uh, first frame I ever got from you was the, the original Vortex, mm-hmm. um, and I ran it in a Stretch X configuration. But mm-hmm. you can also switch it around and run it in a Wide X or a yep. Dead Cat. Right. Uh, so that was, that was kind of nice to be able to pick. And that was at a time when, you know, people were just starting to experiment with different frame geometries. Right. So right. people were moving away from the traditional H quads. Um, mm. And, you know, we started to see more 
more of the pod style X quads or, or stretched X's that we're running now. But I think it'd be nice to be able to pick if it's okay. not, um, you know, if it doesn't compromise the strength of the frame and it's right. not a major, you know, a major hassle. Right. Hey, right. Hey, Joe, can I, can I yeah. trouble you with an idea? Um, yeah, because on, that, like what, what you two are discussing is kind of interesting because it's so true. But since this frame is so much larger, um, is it possible to make it to where you can actually designate how much of a stretch and how much of an exit is? As in like the the arm where it h hits the body, that should be a part where you can actually just uh, – I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know the proper wording for this. But you remember the first – Ah uh, shoot! I don't remember uh, the first uh, quad, racing quad from Immersion to where it had those foldable arms. I yes, don't remember. That, that was the original Vortex Two A. Yeah, yeah, like that one. But yeah. instead of having it just snap to one position, being able to snap to multiple positions, but instead of yeah. maybe snapping, you use screws instead or something like that. Yeah. Maybe something yeah, no, like that. Uh, yeah, no, actually, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of. That's what I'm kind of feeling right now. Is it's not necessarily because we can have a beefier body on here, right? I can make uh, mounting patterns. Let's say let's say we use two sets of braces to mount the arm to the body, right? One is fixed at the end, right? And the other one you can you can tilt it. They're like like they're like four sets of holes, right? Yeah. So you could go on each arm. You can go some kind of cattywampus thing and try to fly this weird thing. Or like <laughs> two, you can make uh, a stretched X, and the the back two you can make the regular X, right? Fly that what 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 Eric Van Lenty calls the pouncing stance. Right. Actually, I think Duncan flew that kind of stance at, at I.O. Um, you know, so something like that, it's, at least in the experiment experimentation stage, uh, we could definitely do that. It's just an extra set of holes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And you just have to worry a little bit about how the arm is going through those first two holes. But I think that's fine. I think that'll work because, you know, honestly, the difference between a stretched X, a nice stretch and a pure X is five degrees on the arm. That's it. And that's actually, Andrew, why you could do. By flipping over those vortex arms, you could do a squish or you could do a stretch. You know, it's 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 five degrees one way or the other. Right. That's it. So I think we can definitely do that, now, and and I'll definitely keep that in mind as as we move forward on this for sure. Cool. Um, speaking of speaking of mounts to the frame, do you like two sets or two sets, three sets of, of braces? What do you think that arm should be in the frame? Uh, how you know, uh, like how many how many bracing points should we have? I would probably say two for now. Um, okay. Probably two of them, probably about uh, either half or three eighths of an inch wide, and mm -hmm. maybe uh, half to three quarters of an inch in between the two of them. Half to three so quarters. That seems a little. I mean, I'm thinking like like an inch and a half to two inches between one end stop to where it meets the frame. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that I think that yeah, that would be fine. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. I've got stuff I can work on now. Cool. Any features yeah. you would like, Andrew, on uh, on Joe's list? Um, I think a lot of it has already been covered. Um, right. I I would like you know the the. The brackets, I think, are a great engineered failure point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, flexible bat uh, flexible battery mounting would be awesome. Um, when, when you talk about flexible, do you do they generally mount them um, next side by side or front to back? Most of the guys that have seen running two batteries are running them front to back, uh, kind okay. of in a heli configuration. Right. But right. you know, I don't think we absolutely have to do that. But if you do that, I would run them, I wouldn't run them, you know, I'd run them long ways from the back to the front of the canopy. So you're keeping most of your weight centralized to lower your rotating mass when you're rolling okay. it. How, how many straps do you generally use per battery? I use two. Um, okay. That's what I see most people running. Okay. Okay. Then I'll make three just in case. There you yeah. go. <laughs> I like that. Extra security. Extra security. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm talking to RJX Hobby right now too. They have some 400 millimeter Kevlar battery straps that I'm getting ready to put an order in on. Um, I think those would be 
a good choice for it because you have, you know, 5,000 or more milliamps slung on there and uh-huh. rather not eject them all over the field when I crash. So. <laughs> hey, see if you can get a bulk order because, you know, that's, Y and I are going to need some. Yes, that's what definitely. I'm on. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll message you guys off the, uh, off the, pod ch- the yeah. podcast and we can set that up. Actually, speaking of which, I know at least 10 guys right now who have been bugging me um, about this. You know, we, I mean, we have we have Jay Day out of Dayton and he is all over this, man. He wants to do it. You know, we have a lot of the QRGO and Buck FPV guys who want to do this, too. Maybe we should consider doing bulk buys for a lot of the stuff we do. And I could I could probably try to run some of that too. Um, see what we can get. That would. Yeah, that would be fantastic. All right. We done. Andrew, you got anything else you want to talk about? Um. No, I don't think I have anything else. Um, pretty much ticked all the boxes that I have. All right, cool. Uh, Joe, you good? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm I'm going to get started on this, and uh, let's see what we come up with. Yeah, I'm, I'm right? excited. I'm excited to see what uh, what this could be because uh, it's definitely a brave new frontier, and uh, we can make something that's really cool, not just for us, but uh, to a lot of other people that might be interested in getting in. Yep, for sure, for sure. Uh, All right, cool. Uh, I am going to go ahead and shut off the podcast, and we will pick back up when, most likely, when Joe has, like, the first frame designed. He might not be cutting it, but we definitely want to see what his opinions are when he starts designing this, and uh, we'll be excited to uh, start seeing these frames go out and uh, start testing them. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one one thing I can do now is I can pull up Ricky's old files and send you guys some renderings and, you know, just give me some feedback on it. Yeah. All right. Will do. All right, guys. Cool.